My dear Wormwood. Uncle Screwtape, it, it was kind of you to come. Kind? Don't be absurd. Uh, not kind. If by my advice you succeed with your patient, then I'll have benefited our father's work and avoided his usual punishment and tortures. If you fail, then I will relish in applying those punishments and tortures to you. Where's your patient? Inside. Hmm. The pub. Isn't that a rather boring and conventional attack? W uh, come and see. I'm sorry, chaps, but I don't know how far science can go before it turns back on itself. Reversing the goodness it purports to create. Hmm? Well, well, what do you mean, Hamilton? How far is too far? I saw in the newspapers this morning that a group of scientists, in Vienna, I think, have invented a means to splice the glands of young apes into old men, which, which renews their generative powers. Truly? Why, that's remarkable, Richard. Well, I would say so. Imagine the impact that it would have. There, you see? This is not about drink or carousing. And your patient is? The one on the right, called John Hamilton. Mm, yes. Is it so remarkable, Norman? It sounds unnatural to me. Unnatural? Oh, explain yourself, Hamilton. How could it be unnatural if a group of men, who are as natural as nature itself, accomplish it? Oh, I suppose we have to define what we mean by natural. Well, let's not get bogged down in semantics. Just what think of the significance of it. It could be the next adaptation in the evolutionary chain. I mean, embrace it, Hamilton. You'll be an old man yourself one day. I would rather be an old man than a young monkey. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I've been guiding his reading and taking care that he spends a good deal of time with his materialist friends. Well, I suppose that strategy has its merits, but are you not being a trifle naive? N naive, Uncle? Well, it seems as if you suppose that argument is the best way to keep him out of the enemy's clutches. Well, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I, I, I suppose it might have worked if he'd lived a few centuries ago. At that time, humans still knew pretty well when a thing was proved and when it was not. And if it was proved, they really believed it. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, they still connected thinking with doing and were prepared to alter their way of life as a result of a chain of reasoning. Yes. But what with the weekly press and other such weapons, we have largely altered that. Your man has been accustomed ever since he was a boy to a dozen incompatible philosophies dancing about together inside his head. Mm. Yes, he doesn't think of doctrines as primarily true or false, but as academic or practical or outworn or contemporary or conventional or ruthless. Uh -huh. Jargon, my boy. Not argument is your best ally in keeping him from the church. I see. Don't waste time trying to make him think that materialism is true. <laughs> make him think that it is strong or stark or courageous. That's the sort of thing he cares about. Oh, uh, right. The trouble with argument is that it moves the whole struggle onto the enemy's own ground. He can argue too, whereas in really practical propaganda of the kind I am suggesting, he has been shown for centuries to be greatly the inferior of our father below. By the very act of arguing, you awake the patient's faculty of reason. And once it is awake, who can foresee the result? Even if a particular train of thought can be twisted so as to end in our favor, you will find that you have been strengthening in your patient the fatal habit of attending to universal issues and withdrawing his attention from the stream of immediate sense experiences. Your business is to fix his attention on the stream. Teach him to call it real life. Right, but, but what do we mean by real life? That is the whole point! I'm sorry. You mustn't let him ask that question! Remember, he is not, like you, a pure spirit. Never having been a human, oh, that abominable advantage of the enemies. You don't realize how enslaved they are to the pressure of the ordinary. I, I don't understand. Of course you don't. Let me show you an incident from the past. 
What is this place? Have you never taken your patient to the British Museum? No. Ah, oh, you should. It can be an invaluable tool if handled properly. Hours lost in reading, in viewing great displays of mankind without thinking for a moment about man, meaning the actual human being standing only a few feet away. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll see, with my patient reading on that bench, how it almost went pear-shaped for me. Twenty years of work, very nearly lost, all because of one idle thought while visiting this museum. What idle thought? Listen. All these displays and artifacts, all these remnants of history, is this all we have to show for our lives? Oh, uh oh Yes, and this from a sound atheist. The enemy, of course, was at his elbow in a moment ready to nurture that thought, to lead the patient to considering disgusting ideas like the mortality of man and the possibility of eternity. <sighs> If I had lost my head and begun to attempt a defense by argument, I should have been undone, but I was not such a fool. I struck instantly at the part of the man which I had best under my control and suggested it was just about time he had some lunch. Mmm, a bacon sandwich. <laughs> the enemy presumably made the counter-suggestion. You know how one can never quite overhear what he says to them. That line of thought, is this all we have to show for our lives? <laughs> At least I think that must have been his line, for I said to the patient, quite. In fact, much too important to tackle at the end of a morning. True. Much better to come back after lunch and go into it with a fresh mind. Of course. Right. There's a lovely cafe just around the corner. <laughs> Once he was in the streets, the battle was won. I showed him a newsboy shouting the midday paper and uh, a number 73 bus going past. And before he reached the bottom of the steps, I had got into him an unalterable conviction that whatever odd ideas might come into a man's head when he was shut up in a museum with his readings, a healthy dose of real life... Meaning the bus and the newsboy. Precisely, was enough to show him how all that sort of thing just couldn't be true. He knew he'd had a narrow escape, and in later years he was fond of talking about it. He is now safe in our father's house. Excellent. Oh, you begin to see the point. Thanks to processes which we set at work in them centuries ago, they find it all but impossible to believe in the unfamiliar while the familiar is before their eyes. I see. Keep pressing home on your patient the ordinariness of things. Don't let him get away from that invaluable real life. Right, right. 